Thank you so much, Professor Rora, for those very kind words. And I must say that uh, it's been a pleasure uh, to be here and see you all here. Um, Dr. Mathur, uh, Vibha Mathur, ladies and gentlemen, I do feel very privileged to join you in Jaipur for this year's fourth Shiv Charan Mathur Memorial Lecture to celebrate the memory and legacy of a man who showed that he was more than just a political leader, rising indeed as a battle-hardened warrior of the people of Rajasthan and one of the tall figures who held up the flag of the Congress party and its ideals in another time. His was a remarkable career of public service. While his work in mainstream politics is well known, it is often forgotten that Sri Shivcharan Mathur's engagement with the political complexities of our country began with the Quit India movement, where, though a boy in his early teens, he took up the Mahatma's call to do or die. In a sense, that slogan came to characterize his own approach towards his political career and his service in our land. From 1957, when he was first elected as chairman of the municipal council from Bilwara, to twice representing his people in the Lok Sabha, to being the voice of Rajasthan during his two terms as this state's chief minister, and to finally serving as the governor of Assam. Of course, this is but a glimpse into his much larger list of achievements, one which it would be practically impossible to completely do justice to in the short session. I wonder what Sri Martha would have taught of today, thought of today's brand of politics and power relations, and for the system itself. I listened uh, with great attention to my friend Sachin Pilot. Um, I told him that I hoped he would say a few words of disagreement. I have the very highest respect for Sachin. I actually feel that our country's politics is in good hands if the younger generation can produce a leader like Sachin Pilot, and I feel very happy for the future of India that he is, he is here and active, but that doesn't mean we have to agree all the time. And on this issue, I welcomed his comments. Uh, I want to assure you that in the course of my remarks, I intend to address each of the objections that he voiced, and I have told him so. Um, well, the sweeping electoral victory in 2014 of Narendra Modi's Bharatiya Janta Party, which now enjoys an absolute majority in the Lok Sabha, the first in 25 years, seemed at first glance to have ushered in a period of parliamentary stability. Advocates of constitutional change, who feared India's parliamentary system was no longer capable of producing such a result, could finally take a breather. For the three previous decades, however, the political shenanigans in New Delhi notably the repeated paralysis of parliament by slogan-shouting members violating with impunity every canon of legislative propriety, seemed to confirm once again what I had been arguing for years, that the parliamentary system we borrowed from the British has, in Indian conditions, outlived its utility. Has the time not come to discuss the case, long consigned to the back burner, for a presidential system in India. With Mr. Modi running the country in a quasi-presidential style already, despite heading a parliamentary system, the question may seem absurd. But since nothing is permanent in politics, least of all the prospects of an indefinite BJP majority, the issue may still be worth examining. And I might add that running a parliamentary system in a presidential way is actually the worst of both worlds. So I don't think the country is doing very well out of having a prime minister who conducts his government uh, like a president might. But let me lay out the basic argument, um, which to my, mean, uh, to my mind is the following. Our parliamentary system has created a unique breed of legislature, of legislator, who is largely unqualified to legislate and who has sought election only in order to wield or influence executive power. Because in our country, you elect a parliament to form a government. The very thing Sachin sees as a virtue is what I see as a disadvantage. Because 
in a true separation of powers, just as the judiciary has nothing to do with the legislature or the executive, the legislature itself should be distinct from the judiciary and the executive. Then you have three co-equal branches of government and the country functions more democratically. When the legislature forms the executive, then everything is suspect from the start. The independence of the legislature from the executive is obviously very limited when there is a parliamentary majority. And on top of that, the persons who are elected to the legislature are running for office not in order to write laws or make policy, they are running in order to form the government. So as a result, our legislatures have produced governments obliged to, follow, to, to focus more on politics than on policy or performance. And it has in the process distorted the preferences of our voters, who very often know which individuals they want, but don't necessarily know which party or policies they're voting for. In turn, our system has created parties that are shifting alliances of individual interests rather than vehicles of a coherent set of ideas. It has forced governments to try to concentrate less on governing than on staying in office and obliged them to cater to the lowest common denominator of their coalitions. And let me explain. Every time Parliament grounds to a screaming halt, it was, oh, let's avoid another general election and so on. But apart from the horrendous costs incurred each time in a general election, can we as a country expect elections to always produce a result like 2014, when for 25 years before that they all produced inconclusive item, uh, outcomes and more coalition governments? Is that not more likely in future again? So don't we have to understand that the problem is with the system itself? Pluralist democracy is India's greatest strength. I'm a huge supporter of multi-party democracy. But its current manner of operation is the source of our major weakness. India's many challenges require political arrangements that permit decisive action, whereas ours increasingly promote drift and indecision. We must have a system of government whose leaders can focus on governance rather than on staying in power. The parliamentary system, I would argue, was from the start unsuited to Indian conditions and is primarily responsible for many of our principal political ills. I know that to suggest this is political sacrilege in New Delhi. Um, and as we saw with Sachin, many of the politicians I've discussed this with are reluctant to even contemplate a change. And of course, the main reason is also that they know the present system, they know how it works, they know how to work it and they don't wish to alter the system that they are used to. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't discuss the possibility. Because our reasons for choosing the parliamentary system are themselves embedded in history. Like the American revolutionaries of two centuries earlier, Indian nationalists had fought for the rights of Englishmen, which they thought that replicating the Westminster system was going to give them. The parliamentary system that was devised in Britain was based for a small island nation with electorates initially of a few thousand voters per MP. Even today, an MP never represents more than 100,000, 1 lakh voters. So they can, for the most part, meet all their voters, knock on every door in their constituency. And this, therefore, assumes a number of conditions that don't exist in India. As Sachin himself admitted, each MP represents 2.5 million people, 25 lakh people. It requires the parliamentary system requires a clearly defined political party concept. Each party represents in the Western parliamentary systems a coherent set of policies, ideologies, preferences that distinguish it from the next. Whereas in India, a party is all too often a label of convenience, which a politician can adopt or discard as frequently as a Bollywood film star, a film star changes costumes. The principal parties, whether national or otherwise, are fuzzily vague about their beliefs. If you can tell me the difference in the political beliefs of the Samajwadi party from the Congress party, I'll give you a prize. I mean, essentially, what is in the manifesto, what is in the ideology, it's all the same sort of thing. In many, many parties' ideologies are one variant or another um, uh, of the Nehruvian socialism of the Congress party. We have 
uh, 44 registered political parties recognized by the Election Commission and a staggering 93 registered but unrecognized from the Adarsh Lok Dal to the Womanist Party of India. I think you may have heard recently that when there was talk about Mulayam Singh Ji having to have a separate party label and a symbol, very conveniently somebody was able to offer him a version of the Lok Dal with a new symbol that they said Mulayam Singh Ji can come and take over. 903 parties. Most of these parties, frankly, have never contested an election in the last 20 years. Um, now, with the sole exceptions of the BJP and the Communists, the existence of the serious political parties as entities separate from the big tent of the Congress is always a result purely of electoral arithmetic or regional identities and not political conviction. And even there, even if you look at the Communists, what on earth is the continuing case after the demise of the Soviet Union and the reinvention of China for two separate recognized communist parties and a dozen unrecognized parties of the communist movement? Now this lack of ideological coherence in India is in stark, stark contrast to the UK. With few exceptions, India's parties all profess their faith in the same set of rhetorical cliches, notably socialism, Secularism, a mixed economy, non-alignment, all of which terms they are equally loath to define. No wonder the communists, when they served in the United Front governments and when they supported the first UPA, had no difficulty signing on to the common minimum program articulated by their so-called bourgeois allies. The BGP used to be thought of as an exception, but in its attempts to broaden its base of support, it sounds and behaves more or less like the other parties, except, of course, on the emotive issue of cultural identity and nationalism, which we can talk about during our question and answer period, if you wish. So our parties are not ideologically coherent. They take few distinct positions and do not base themselves on political principles. As organizational entities, therefore, they are dispensable, and they are sometimes cheerfully dispensed with or split, reformed, merged, dissolved, at the convenience of politicians. The sight of a leading figure from a major party leading it to join another party or to start his own, which would send shockwaves through the political system in other parliamentary democracies, is commonplace, even banal, in our country. One prominent UP politician, if memory serves, has switched parties nine times in the last couple of decades. But his voters were more consistent because they voted for him rather than the label he was sporting, at least until he came a cropper in 2014. In the absence of a real party system, the voter chooses not between parties, but between individuals, usually on the basis of their caste, their public image, or other personal qualities. But since the individual is elected in order to be part of a majority that will form the government, party affiliations matter. So voters were told if they want Indira Gandhi as Prime Minister, or they want Jail Alita as Chief Minister, or Mamta Banerjee as Chief Minister, they must vote for someone else in order to indirectly accomplish their result. You have to vote for the candidate of their party who will make her the Chief Minister or the Prime Minister. Now it's a perversity only the British could have devised. To vote for a legislature, not to legislate, but to form the executive. Now, so much for political theory. But the result of the profusion of small parties is that for nearly a quarter century, we've had coalition governments of a couple of dozen parties, some with just um, a member or two of parliament. And our parliament had, not till 2014, seen a single party majority since Rajiv Gandhi lost his in 1989. As a result, for the longest time, India's democracy has been condemned to run by the lowest common denominator, hardly a recipe for decisive action. The disrepute into which the political process has fallen in India and the widespread cynicism about the motives of our politicians can be traced directly to the workings of our parliamentary system. Holding the executive hostage to the agendas of a range of motley partners is nothing but a recipe for governmental instability. And instability is precisely what India, with its critical economic and social challenges, cannot afford. I mean, look what happened between roughly 1995 and 1999. 
How many elections did we have? How many governments fell? How many prime ministers did we have? Now, in a country with the kind of pressing problems we have, is this a system that makes sense for us? Now, very few elections will give you a 2014 kind of result. And we really have to ask ourselves, do we want, you know, what, 1996, 1998, 1999, election after election, four different prime ministers, Devagara ji, Gujarat ji, Vajpayee ji, I mean, this is getting to be a joke. And we really have to ask ourselves at the end of the day, people are entering parliament in order to form a government. Because after all, you can elect a government directly. Now there are four specific problems from here. First, once you are, have to be in parliament to be a minister, be in government, then you're limiting executive post to those who are electable rather than those who are able. So the prime minister cannot appoint a cabinet of his choice. He has to cater to the question of who has been elected, accommodate the political wishes uh, of the leaders of several parties. Yes, he can bring some members in through the Rajya Sabha, but of course our upper house has been largely also the province of full-time politicians, and so the talent pool has not been significantly widened. Second, it puts a defection, a premium on defection and horse trading. The Anti-Defection Act of 1985 was necessary because in many states and after 1979 at the center also, parliamentary floor crossing had become a popular pastime and with lakhs of rupees and many ministerial posts changing hands. That now cannot happen without attracting disqualification. So the bargaining has shifted to the allegiance of whole parties rather than individuals. Given the present national situation with the BJP's majority, such anxieties seem remote, but then imagine what could happen after the next elections. Third, legislation suffers. Most laws are drafted by the executive, in practice by the bureaucracy, and parliamentary input into their formulation and passage is minimal, with very many bills passing after barely five minutes of debate. The ruling coalition, inevitably issues a whip to its members in order to ensure unimpeded passage of a bill. And since defiance of a whip itself attracts disqualification, MPs loyally vote as their party directs. So you get elected to parliament, but you can't really think or speak for yourself or express your own views. The party tells you how to vote. The party tells you what the line is. The parliamentary system, in other words, does not permit the existence of a genuine legislature distinct from the executive, applying its collective mind freely to the nation's laws. So one of the things I disagree with Sasha Don is I'd argue that our parliamentary system, the way it works, is not truly able to articulate the different diversity of views in our country on most issues. Of course, apologists for the present system say in its defense that it has served to keep the country together and given every Indian a stake in the nation's political destiny. That was such a specific argument. But I would say that is what democracy has done, not necessarily the parliamentary system. Any form of genuine democracy would achieve that, and ensuring popular participation and accountability between elections is vitally necessary. But what our present system has not done as well as other democratic systems might, is to ensure effective performance. The case for a presidential system of either the French or the American style has, in my view, never been clearer. The French version, by combining presidential rule with a parliamentary government headed by a prime minister, is superficially more attractive since it resembles our own system, except for reversing the balance of power between the president and the council of ministers. This is what the Sri Lankans opted for when they jettisoned the British model. But given India's fragmented party system, the prospects for parliamentary chaos distracting the elected president are considerable. In Sri Lanka, they really only have three major parties. In India, of course, there are 45 parties in parliament. An American or Latin American model, with the president serving both as head of state and head of government, might better evade the problems we have experienced with political factionalism. But either approach would separate the legislative functions from the executive, and most important, would free the executive from dependence on the legislature for its survival. A directly elected chief executive in New Delhi 
instead of being vulnerable to the shifting stands of coalition support politics, would, because he would have stability of tenure, free from legislative will. If a president is elected for five years, he cannot be defeated by a majority changing in parliament. So he would be able to appoint a cabinet of talents or, and be able to devote his or her energies to governance and not just to government. I mean, look at uh, our Prime Minister today, Mr. Modi, even though he has a secure majority, he is running around campaigning in every state election. Where is the time to do the job for which he was elected, which is to serve the nation? He is busy trying to win his majority uh, in various states. The Indian voter will be able to vote directly for the individual he or she wants to be ruled by, and then the president will truly be able to speak for a majority of Indians rather than just a majority of MPs. At the end of a fixed period of time, let's say in the present five years we give our looks of her, the public will be free to judge the individual on performance in improving the lives of Indians rather than on political skill in keeping a government in office. But why then do the arguments for a presidential system get such short shrift from our political class as we saw today? At the most basic level, our parliamentarians' fondness for the parliamentary system rests on familiarity. This is the system they know. They are comfortable with it. They know how to make it work for themselves. They polish the skills required to triumph on it. Most non-politicians in India would see this as not a recommendation for the status quo, but a disqualification. But nonetheless, the most serious argument often advanced by liberal Democrats is that the presidential system carries with it the risk of dictatorship. They conjure up the image of an imperious president immune to parliamentary defeat and impervious to public opinion, ruling the country by fiat. Of course, it does not help that during the emergency, some around Srimati Indira Gandhi also contemplated abandoning the parliamentary system for a modified form of Gaulism, and many Indian Democrats said, no, 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 presidential system is like emergency rule. But the emergency itself is the best answer to such fears, because it demonstrated that even a parliamentary system can be distorted to permit autocratic rule. And you see how Mr. Narendra Modi uh, actually has risen to power and created a very powerful prime minister's office. Um, and, and unfortunately, he has done so in the parliamentary system in a way in which every um, ministry has to send its files to his office for clearance, thereby putting himself in a position um, that, as I said earlier, represents the worst of both possible worlds. I, I would argue that a President Modi could scarcely be more autocratic than Prime Minister Modi already is. And therefore, that objection, to my mind, has nothing to do with the merits of a presidential system or not, but rather with the style of functioning of the particular individual. So dictatorship is not the result of a particular type of governmental system, rather of the individuals. Now, if you look at Mr. Modi in the parliamentary system, he has sidelined all the BJP politicians and statesmen who were senior to him, relegating the most senior to the Mar Darshak Mandal with no functions or authority whatsoever. He has appointed not particularly political heavyweights in many ministerial positions to make it clear that he would personally call the shots in their area of responsibility. He has dismantled the UPA's decision-making empowered groups of ministers and instead disempowered his ministers. Deciding his cabinet's agenda without consultation, working directly with the bureaucrats and the secretaries, bypassing their own nominal bosses, the ministers. Now, in a parliamentary system, it is the cabinet that is supposed to be collectively responsible to parliament. And as Sachin himself was saying, it's the ministers who rise to answer questions on the policies they have ostensibly formulated. But, under Mr. Modi, MPs find themselves, opposition MPs find themselves, in the odd position of interrogating ministers about decisions they may not have made because the policies have been formulated directly by the bureaucracy with the prime minister and the ministers have to answer questions when they themselves haven't made the policies. So how could the President Modi be any worse than this kind of Prime Minister Modi? And when Sachin says that the prime minister is accountable to parliament, 
मैं सिर्फ ये पूछूंगा आपने कितने बार देखे हैं नरेंद्र मोदी जी पार्लियामेंट में जवाब देते हुए ही हार्डली कम सुपर ही हैज मेड मोर स्पीचेस इन फॉरेन पार्लियामेंट देन ही हैज एन आवर्स सो आई डोंट थिंक द पार्लियामेंट्री सिस्टम हैज वर्क द वे सच इन पार्लियामेंट इट इन एनी केस टू ऑफसेट द टेम्पटेशन फॉर अ नेशनल प्रेजिडेंट टू बिकम ऑल पावरफुल and to give real substance to the decentralization essential for a country of india's size and i agree with such in such a vast country needs a democratic and decentralized model of governance my argument is that you should have not only a president sitting in delhi you should have directly elected chief executives in the states and directly elected town mayors i have introduced a private members bill in parliament that says that mayors should be directly elected and should be given authority to run their cities which right now they don't have so i would argue the case for such a system is even stronger in the in the cities and the states and in the center so those who reject a presidential system on the ground that it might lead to a dictatorship have to be assured or maybe assured that the powers of the president would thus be balanced by those of the directly elected chief executives in the states now at the local levels as i said it's very important to have genuine powers even a communist autocracy like china empowers its local authorities with genuine decentralized powers if a businessman wants to set up a factory and he agrees with the town mayor everything from the required permissions to land water sanitation security financial or tax incentives everything can be given by the mayor he has the authority whereas in india a mayor is little more than a glorified committee chairman with little power and minimal resources in fact even the decisions are not even effectively made by the various committees in the municipal council there is often an ias officer i know we have a couple of retired ias officers sitting here a municipal an ias officer called with a title like municipal commissioner who's exercising the real power but because he's not elected he is not directly accountable to the people the way the powerless mayor is it's again the worst of both worlds in this system so to give effect to meaningful self government we need directly elected mayors directly elected panchayat presidents and zilla presidents each with real authority and financial resources to deliver results in their own geographical areas intellectual defenders of the present system feel that it does remarkably well in reflecting as sachin was saying the heterogeneity of the indian people and bringing them along on the journey of national development but I would say to such an even the president would have to work with an elected legislature which given the logic of elected uh, of electoral arithmetic and the pluralist reality of india would be the home for our country's heterogeneity so you would still have a parliament elected from around the country any president worth his democratic salt would name a cabinet reflecting the diversity of our country bill clinton said in america when he had you know one there were only seven cabinet members in america where he had one black one chinese one you know woman and so on and, and he said the cabinet must look like america the same logic any cabinet in india must look like india so i don't think that you can worry about all the diversity not being represented in a presidential system especially since democracy is vital i have argued this in many of my books vital for india's survival a chronic pluralism is an essential element of what we are yes democracy is an end in itself we are right to be proud of it but not the kind of politics that our version of democracy has inflicted upon us we must have a democracy that delivers that delivers progress to our people changing to a presidential system is the best way of ensuring a democracy that works that works for india as at the most important thing for india some might ask dr ambedkar had argued in the constitution in the constituent assembly that the framers of the constitution felt the parliamentary system placed responsibility over stability while the presidential placed stability over responsibility he didn't refer to accountability versus performance but the idea is the same is efficiency and performance the most important yardstick for judging our system when the inefficiencies of our present system have still kept india united muddling through as the functioning anarchy in gabbard's phrase to me yes after nearly 7 decades of freedom we can take our democracy and our unity largely for granted 
It is now time to start focusing on delivering results for our people. Here Dr. Ambedkar said, and I quote, the presidential system of America is based upon the separation of the executive and the legislature, so the president and his cabinet secretaries cannot be members of Congress. The draft constitution does not recognize this doctrine. The ministers under the Indian Union are members of parliament. Only members of parliament can become ministers. Ministers have the same rights as other members of parliament. They can sit in parliament, take part in debates, both in its proceedings. Both systems of government, said Dr. Ambedkar, are of course democratic, and the choice between the two is not very easy. A democratic executive must satisfy two conditions. One, it must be a stable executive, and two, it must be a responsible executive. Unfortunately, he says, it is not so far been possible to devise a system which can ensure both in equal degree. You can have a system which can give you more stability but less responsibility, or you can have a system which gives you more responsibility but less stability. The American and the Swiss systems give more stability but less responsibility. The British system, on the other hand, gives you more responsibility but less stability. The reason for this is obvious. The American executive is a non-parliamentary executive, which means that it is not dependent for its existence upon a majority in Congress, while the British system is a parliamentary executive. So the Congress of the United States, the parliament there, cannot dismiss the executive, whereas in the parliamentary system, the government must resign if it loses the confidence of a majority of the parliament. Looking at it from the point of view of responsibility, a non-parliamentary executive being independent of parliament tends to be less responsible to the legislature, while a parliamentary executive becomes more responsible. This is what Dr. Ambedkar's argument was. But the fact is that it's the people who do the assessment. The parliament can write laws and pass it because party majorities will no longer determine the government or the survival of the president. The party whip system can be reduced. We can limit it to just one or two kinds of issues, maybe money bills, budget bills, and the MPs can speak their own mind. In America today, an MP or a senator or a congressman from the ruling president's party can challenge an action of the president and that is not considered disloyal. That is the way in which he or she represents the interests of his constituency, of his voters, which we can't do in India. So my uh, question is, has the Indian parliamentary system in fact functioned as Dr. Ambedkar envisioned? He wanted a daily assessment of responsibility in parliament that every day MPs would be holding the government responsible for what they were doing. But given the performance of our parliament that you've all seen, even in the last 10 years, would you say that this is a serious proposition, that we're seeing a daily accountability? All the disruptions, all the adjournments, all the tamasha that goes on? What would happen to issues of performance of a president and a legislature were elected? from opposite and antagonistic parties, some say. In America, for example, Barack Obama has discovered that he has a Republican majority, he couldn't get anything done. But in the era of coalitions that we have entered, the chances of any party receiving an overwhelming majority and being able to block the president's plans are minimal. And if such a situation does arise, it will be the responsibility of the president to test the metal of the leadership of the day. And what's wrong with that? In our fragmented political uh, policy with dozens of political parties in the fray, the kind of two-party gridlock you have in the US, Democratic president, Republican Congress, that won't happen in India. Because even in the BJP wave of 2014, 37 parties made it to the Lok Sabha. So even if the president doesn't enjoy a, a future president in my formulation, doesn't enjoy a majority in parliament, then an Indian president, instead of facing a monolithic opposition, would probably have 37 parties in parliament to deal with, and he would have the opportunity to build issue-based coalitions on different issues. Maybe one party will agree with him on one issue, another party will agree with him on a different issue. He would call for the deployment of persuasive skills to get legislation through, but that would be the opposite of the dictatorship or the steamroller that critics of the system 
are suggesting would happen under a president. Now, how would we popularly elect a president? How would you avoid the distortions that our Westminster-style par parliamentary system has bequeathed to us? In my view, the virtue of a system of directly elected chief executives at all levels would be the straightforward lines of division between the legislature and the executive branches of government. The electoral process to get there may not be as simple as today. Elections in our country are bound to be a messy affair. It will be a long while before we have a tiny, conveniently tidy two-party system. So I'm not, uh, I don't share Sachin's worry that the whole nation will only have two or three people to choose from. Look what happens in the French presidential system. Every self-proclaimed Netaji can run in the first round, with or without party backing. They were very low threshold. I think uh, it's enough to get 10 elected officials. It can even be 10 panchayat members to nominate you. You can run. So in the first round, there may be 20, 30 candidates. But then there is a second round involving only the top two candidates. And that is when the nation gets a real choice. And uh, what we could do, of course, we could have a higher threshold. We could say that to have a manageable number of candidates, everybody's nomination papers would have to be signed by, say, at least 10 MPs or 20 MLAs or something like that. Um, now, if by some uh, miracle, one candidate manages to win 50% plus one, then he or she is elected in the first round. But that's a very far-fetched possibility, since even Mrs. Indira Gandhi, at the height of her popularity, never won more than 47% of the national vote for the Congress. And Mr. Modi, with his huge majority, actually only won 31% of the vote for the Congress. So I don't see anybody winning on a first ballot. So the two highest vote getters will then face each other in round two. The defeated aspirants would throw their support to one or the other survivor. Indian politicians being what they are, there will be some hard bargaining and the exchange of promises and compromises. But at the end, a president will emerge who truly has enjoyed the support of a majority of the country's electorate. Now, Sachin asks, does such a system not automatically favor candidates from the more populous states? He said, could uh, Devagada ever become president in this system? I would expand that question. Is there any chance that someone from Manipur or Lakshadweep will ever win the votes or majority of the country's voters? Could a Muslim or a Dalit ever be elected president? These are fair questions, but the answer surely is that their chances would be no better and no worse than they are under our present system. Seven of India's first 11 prime ministers, after all, came from Uttar Pradesh, which surely has no monopoly on political wisdom. And perhaps a similar proportion of our directly elected presidents might also be UPIs as well. How does it matter? Most democratic systems tend to favor majorities. It is no accident that every president of the United States from 1789 to 2008 was a white male Christian. And all of bar one was also a Protestant. Only one Welshman has been prime minister of Great Britain. But then Obama came along, proving that majorities can identify themselves with the right representative, even of a visible minority. I dare say that the need to appeal to the rest of the country will oblige a would-be president from UP to reach across the boundaries of region, language, caste, and religion, whereas in our present parliamentary system, a politician elected in his constituency on the basis of such parochial appeals, caste, language, etc., can jockey his way to the prime ministership on a handful of votes. A directly elected president will, by definition, have to be far more of a national figure than a prime minister who owes his position to a handful of political kingmakers in a coalition card deal. I would also borrow from the U.S. the idea of an electoral college to ensure that our less populous states are not ignored by the candidates. The winner would also be required to carry a majority of states so that crushing numbers in the cow belt alone would not be enough. So the Hindi wala would have to go and get votes from Kerala, just as the Kerala would have to get votes from UP. But why should the Indian electorate prove less enlightened than others around the world? Jamaica, which is 97% black, has elected a white prime minister, Edward Siaga. In Kenya, 
President Daniel Arab Moy hailed from a tribe that makes up just 11% of the population when he got elected. In Argentina, a voting population overweeningly proud of its European origins twice elected a son of Syrian immigrants, Carlos Saul Menem. The same phenomenon occurred in Peru, where former President Alberto Fujimori's ethnicity covers, he's a Japanese, covers less than 1% of the population. The right minority candidate, in other words, can command a majority. To choose the presidential system is not likely to make future Narasimha Rao's impossible. In fact, Narasimha Rao, because he spoke seven or eight languages, might have well been a credible candidate in a presidential system. Indeed, the voters of Guyana, a country that is 50% Indian and 47% black, elected as president a white American Jewish woman who happened to be the widow of the nationalist hero Chedi Jagat, a story with a certain ring of plausibility in India. Now, the adoption of a presidential system will send our politicians scurrying back to the drawing boards. Politicians of all faiths across India have sought to mobilize voters by appealing to narrow identities, by seeking votes in the name of religion, caste, and region. They have urged voters to define themselves on these lines. Under our parliamentary system, we are more and more defined by our narrow particulars. And it has become more important to be a Muslim, a Bodo, or a Yadav than to be an Indian. Our politics have created a discourse in which a clamor goes up for Assam for the Assamese, Jharkhand for the Jharkhandis, Maharashtra for the Maharashtrians. A presidential system will oblige candidates to renew the demand for an India for the Indians. Any politician with aspirations to rule India as president will have to win the support of people beyond his or her home turf. He or she will have to reach out to other groups, other interests, other minorities. And since the directly elected president will not have coalition partners to blame for his or her inaction, a presidential term will have to be justified in terms of results and accountability will be direct and personal. In that may lie the presidential system's ultimate vindication. So this is my argument. As you can see, I've tried to address all the points that Sachin made in his disagreement. I'm sorry he's not here to refute me. We could have had a genuinely good parliamentary debate if we had been able to stay. But let me thank you all for giving me this platform and inviting me to speak on the occasion of the fourth Shiv Charan Mathur Memorial Lecture. If anyone has any questions, I'm very happy to address them. And uh, if not, I'm also happy to say thank you very much to the organizers for giving me this platform to share my thoughts with you. Jeff.